Yeah. Yeah, I love Kim, love her story. That's just a very small part of it that I hope we get to hear more of um, in the future. But I think she just describes a very beautiful picture of what it looks like to be taking next steps and, and on a journey towards Jesus, but doing it with other people. And it's just so important. And uh, uh, just for her to reference a number of different kinds of small groups. And that's, that's just the encouragement for you today is it's, it's time to maybe for some of you to step into a small group and consider what that might look like to journey with other people towards Jesus. And so um, groups are open right now. I mean, you can go check out the website, ChristChurchCamden.com. You can go to the app. All those instructions are in the back of the seat in front of you. Or you could actually talk to somebody in the lobby on your way out the door today. And what you'll see is a couple of different groups. And um, there's going to be men's, women's. Um, you got to go to the appropriate one. You can't go to a women's group if you're a dude looking for a date, okay? So just go to the one that, suits, that fits you. Um, young adults, um, all that kind of stuff. But you're going to find rooted and message-based at this time. So rooted, if you've never stepped into a group before, is the one I would encourage you to try first. And it's the one we say, hey, everybody should go check that out and do that. So rooted. The other is message-based, which means um, what we talk about here on Sunday morning, you go a little bit deeper with and figure out your next steps with a group of other people. So you, we'll give you the questions and guide you through it. You, you could roll in there and go, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. And you're still discussing the message, okay? But you can get with some other people and kind of solidify your, your next steps. So that's groups. Give it a try. And if you, you step into a group and you're like, I don't like these people. I don't feel comfortable here. That's fine. Just go to another one. All right? So we'll help you with that. All right. Luke chapter 15. Um, if you have a hard copy of the scriptures, and I encourage you to bring that open up to the middle. You're likely going to be in the book of Psalms. Turn to the right a little bit. You come to Jesus, and we say there are four people who write about the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke is where we're going to be, and then, and then John, and uh, Luke chapter 15. Perhaps the most um, famous story that Jesus ever told. Don't think it was necessarily true, but it illustrates some true things. And uh, we're going to finish here. Uh, next week, we started last week, and so if you missed that, I think you can catch up very quickly, but we'll finish here next week. And let me just encourage you next week to um, consider reaching out to a friend and invite someone to maybe come and sit with you. I think it's going to be a great day for that to take place. Um, also, we're celebrating many baptisms next Sunday as well. Some of you just needed that date on the calendar and you're starting to sign up. So that'll be a great day for people to come and uh, check everything out. Luke chapter 15. I want to start in verse 1 and 2 because it's important to keep in mind who Jesus is talking to, okay? And it says, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. So over here on this side, we have all the sinners and then the really, really special group of sinners, the tax collectors. And so really bad people, they lie, they cheat, they steal, they smoke in the kids' pool, probably cheer for the ravens, all the really terrible things over here. Take advantage of people. Don't return their shopping carts, however you want to characterize them. The worst people, but they seem to know that they're in really, really bad shape and that they need to be near Jesus and listen to Jesus. And so when Jesus starts his story, he says, there is a man who had two sons, okay? And the younger one that we talked about last week asked for an early inheritance from his dad, which culturally is like a really big deal. It's like, okay, like I'm not going to get this until you die and you're still alive. Let's pretend that you're dead. Give me everything that I have coming to me. So he took his money. He went off and uh, just a lot of disrespect there. Left home, tanked his life, ended up penniless and actually homeless. And then he had a moment, though, where he literally came to his senses and said, the very best thing for me to do right now is to humble myself and to go back home and see if the Father will actually welcome me back. And so he does that, and just to keep the two sons clear, I want to call him the rebellious younger son, okay? And his story, I believe, is intended to appeal to the sinners and the tax collectors. And I would add to any of us today who are kind of listening in on it, who think, okay, we've traveled away from God before in your life, or you took some steps away from God before, and you're over here wondering, okay, if I was to turn around and go back that direction, how will God receive me? Will he receive me? Is there a place for me? There's a second group listening to Jesus that says, and the Pharisees and the scribes, right? All the good people, they thought they were God's favorites and they thought that because, hey, we do the right things and we do them at the right time and we do them in the right way. And by all appearances on the outside, people thought that they had their lives together. 
and yet their hearts were actually really, really far away from God. And it says they were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And that's an important phrase to keep in mind here in a few minutes. So today I want to look at what we will call the older religious brother. Okay, if we have the younger rebellious son, I want to look at the older religious brother who really serves as a warning that it is possible to be standing right next to the father and still have a heart that doesn't love the father. So whether you relate to the younger son or the older brother, we're called both to find our place at home with the father. So here we go. Last week we left off as the younger rebellious son is welcomed home. It says in verse 24, so they began to celebrate. And a majority of the story that Jesus tells takes place at the party. And this is where we're introduced to the older brother. It says, now his older son was in the field, and as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Okay, your brother's here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. So you got to try to picture this, okay? The music is bumping, there's cars all over the yard, people are everywhere, steaks are coming off of the grill, right? And he's going, okay, it's not my birthday, it's not my father's anniversary, it's not a holiday, like what could possibly be going on here? One of his boys comes over with a report to say, hey, your brother came home, isn't that amazing? Well, the older brother, by the way, is likely the more respected, okay? He's thought to be the model when he is confronted with the thought that his younger brother who left and did what he did has come back and we're throwing a party, like something dark, deep inside of him rises up. And it says, then he became angry and he didn't want to go in. How many of you have been to that family reunion? Like you roll up on the yard and there's cars everywhere and you're going, okay, let's see, like who's here? Oh, I didn't know. You see the Tennessee license plates and you're like, I didn't know they were going to be here. Like, well, that's not the person in the family that we want to hang out with. And okay, this is not, this is not what I wanted. And I didn't know they were coming and there's no way I'm going in there. And you could stand outside and protest. That's what he's doing. Older son looks around and he goes, okay, actually it isn't that great because of course that's what he did. He lost everything. He had to crawl back and come here and the sinner has come home and the father is eating with him. Sound familiar? So his father came out and pleaded with him. Okay, hey, come on. Of course you have to come in. Of course you can't stand up. You've got to join us. And, and I don't want you to miss this, and we'll talk about this here in a second. The party's for all of us. And it's not just for him. The party's for all of us. Because listen, the older brother knows that the day that his younger brother actually comes home would be the happiest day in his dad's life. Now, you have to go in there and celebrate to not go into the party and to actually make your father come all the way out there is an act in his own way of deliberate disrespect. Now, as I'm reading the story, okay, I just want to present to you what I would call four attitudes that I think emerge towards the father and the brother that might help us assess if we have any older religious brother in us and what we can do about it. Because I bet there's some of us in the room today, all right, and we need to do some hard work. Are you excited about that? Uh, more people than first service. So this is, a, this is progress. Awesome. Hey, listen, the challenge of being an older brother is that you almost always never see yourself as an older brother. So he says to his father, okay, now we're going to get to the bottom of his anger. Look, I've been slaving many years for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. I don't know why I think this is so funny. Yeah, you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. Okay, here it is. I've been slaving away for years for you. Okay, he left. I stayed. Um, he wasted his life. I worked hard. And in his heart, he can only see himself as a slave or a servant. He cannot see himself as a son. Attitude number one is this. I have to. Okay, I, I have to. For a lot of us, unfortunately, this is what a relationship with God is like. Like, I have to. See if you can follow this, right? Every single person among us who is saved by God, the Father is saved by grace. But some of us don't naturally go on to grow and become more gracious people. We actually go on to become more religious people. 
say, okay, well, what do, you, what do we mean by religious? Well, let's, let's make sure we understand that. Okay, so there's a point in your life where you were saved, right? You raised a hand, you bowed a head, you said a prayer, you walked an aisle, you got in a tank like this one and you got baptized and assuming it really was you placing your faith and trust in Jesus, somebody said, congratulations, welcome to the family. Right? And there's a little bit of a celebration right there. And in that moment, you were granted something to the effect of what we'll call eternal life insurance. You know what I mean? You're like, okay, if something happens to me and I die, then at least I, I'm set aside, I'm secure, I'm going to go to heaven, and, and I'm going to be with God, right, forever. Unfortunately for some of us, here in the meantime, it's like we've kind of settled into just paying the premiums, if you know what I mean. Hey, we attend and we've paid the premium. We serve when the church needs us, we pay the premium. We give, we do good deeds, right? We're paying premiums as a way of keeping the insurance because we know that we're going to need it someday, if that makes sense. What can happen is we can potentially miss the truth that there is a personal, life-giving, growing love relationship with Jesus that makes a difference in your life here and now today. Listen, you're not a servant, okay? You are a son or a daughter of a father. Now, some of you didn't like this a couple of months ago. I know that because you told me. So I'm going to double down on it today to make sure we're all clear, all right? <laughs> Nervous laughter, I love it. <laughs> Because I, listen, I have such vivid memories of growing up in church, like my whole life, and some of them are good and a lot of them are not good. And um, I just, I have that memory of being in grade school where we walk down the stairs, the dark stairs of the church, and you got that smell. You can smell it. Some of you grew up in this church and you're like, okay, I know I'm getting into the basement. At the bottom of the stairs, I turn right into the first classroom. Mrs. Duhon is there to receive me. The wood paneling in the classroom and the charts are on the wall. We talk about the charts a lot, right? And it's got your name and it's got the subject matter and the things that you did and then the category of stars over here, right? So, okay, you are here today, star, brought your Bible, star. You read your Bible this week, star. Memory verse, star. Oh, you, you knew the verse on the way over here, but you can't say it now. No star for you. And don't get me wrong, okay, these can be very, very good things. We do, they told me after I said this back in June that we do this back in Christ Kids. So, it can be a good thing, all right? It can be a very good thing. Don't, don't miss this. But it can also be fueled by a belief that if I do these things and if I obey God, even though I feel like a servant, maybe God will actually love and accept me. Oh, I, I get the star, but it's possible to actually not get the father. That's what I want you to grasp. Some of us who have lived this way, like we know how exhausting that can be, where we are trying to earn our way closer and closer and closer to the father. That might cause us to pretend as if our life is all together more than it really is. Why? Because we're doing good church stuff. Remember the younger brother's plan, right? I mean, he's down on it, 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 out of luck. He's got nowhere to go, penniless and homeless. And you remember what his plan was? His plan was maybe if I go back home and I offer to serve, if I offer to slave away for my father, maybe he'll welcome me back in. Listen, if the younger son cannot work to get back in the family, older brothers cannot work to stay in the family. You don't get to work to be considered a good son, but that's the essence of religion, that it is possible to end up, okay, trying to be so good or looking so good that we no longer have a need for God. Hope you're clear on that. Wow. I don't want to, be, listen, I don't want to pastor that church. I want to pastor the religious church where we're doing things as a way to get God to like us, that I want to pastor the grace-centered church, okay, that inspires us to be people who follow Jesus because he loves us. Big difference. Like we gl gl gladly, right? We're going to choose to be here. We're going to joyfully engage with the scriptures as a means of knowing Jesus better. We're going to serve others. We're going to give generously, right? Not so that the Father loves us, but because the Father loves us. Big difference, right? But he's angry and he wouldn't go in. The father comes out and pleads with him, and the son, here's his response, look, I've been slaving many years for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. Hey, he hasn't done anything to deserve this. And now we see a second attitude. You, I just can't read it without laughing. You never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. 
hey, I've done everything you asked me to do. You haven't done anything for me. Attitude number two is you owe me. Hey, you, you owe me. You know, again, we looked at the younger son last week and he approached the house after messing up his entire life and he approaches out of relationship. He calls him father and he's approaching that way. Older brother right here, he's not drawing on that relationship. The language he's using here is more reflective of, hey, look here, man. Hey, uh, hey, buddy. Hey, let me tell you what should have happened here. If anyone's getting a party, it should be me. Why haven't you ever done anything for me? Can a brother not even get a goat? <laughs> it's like, hey, look, because of what I'm doing for you, I deserve this. Now, I just kind of wonder how long, like, he's actually felt this way because those aren't just new feelings. Those just don't rise up out of anywhere. Like, hey, you owe me. Can we just try to be honest? We try to do this a lot around here. Like, have you ever felt that way towards God before? Hey, I, I, come on, man, look at the good I'm doing. You owe me. <laughs> I mean, it gets closely tied to the first attitude, right? But look at all the good that we're doing. Look at how good I'm actually being, but it's all out of an expectation that because I'm doing that, God, surely you must owe me something over here. I mean, come on, don't, don't you look around at other people sometimes in your life and you go, really? Why them? <laughs> I mean, she got that job and I can't get one. That dude got someone to marry him and I've been waiting. You, you ever thought that before? God, I'm not sure you even know who these people are. I don't know if you know what they're like or what they're doing. You just gave a really good thing to a really bad person. You ever felt that way before? Hey, I don't, it, it's like you don't even appreciate all the good things that I do over here. Slaving away, right? All the good I've done for you. I think you owe me. You've never given me anything. Older religious brothers, and we're going to include sisters in this one, right, can be just as alienated from the father as younger rebellious sons. One's over here breaking the rules, and one's over here keeping the rules but in the end, they're not really interested in loving the Father. They're only interested in what the Father can do for them and give them. Older brothers try to get control by staying home and being good and you know, I'm going to keep working hard and I'm going to hope that maybe eventually in the end it all pays off for me and now that's going to give me the right to tell the Father how to do things and who to hang out with and what is best and right and good. Remember, our younger son... He comes home saying, listen, I, I'm not worthy, while the older brother stands here saying, you owe me because I deserve it. In 30, he continues his rant. But when this son of yours, who's devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Hey, this son of yours. He doesn't call him brother. He says, your son. If you're a parent, you understand this, right? Your kid does something. And you're looking at them going, where did he get that from? Hey, come in here and get your son. <laughs> right, your daughter's doing dumb stuff, and you're like, I don't know where they learn these kinds of things, and they didn't get that from me. Hey, honey, come see what your daughter is doing. Ever done that before? He doesn't acknowledge him as a brother or an equal because he only sees himself as superior. Hey, he blew your money which you should have never given to him on prostitutes, and he did all the things that we were raised our entire life to reject. Attitude three that he communicates here is, I'm better than you. Hey, I'm better than you. He breaks the rules, I keep the rules. He's bad, I'm good. I've been working all this time. I've never blown any of your money. He's an embarrassment, and I'm humiliated, and... I don't want to share the same last name with him. I'm better than him. And here's the phrase, right? I would never do anything like that. And I don't know about you, but get, get, maybe it is me. I, I, I've mastered the art of seeing all of the really bad decisions that everybody else makes. Anybody else? And sometimes to the neglect of my own. I'll give you a story. I don't know that I've shared this with you all before, but... Way back in my early 20s, um, 
<laughs> I had accumulated a few traffic violations. I mean, who doesn't? Anybody not? Nobody has tra anybody not have a traffic violation? All right, great. We're in the right company here. So I'd accumulated a few. And when I say a few, what I really mean is seven speeding tickets and one failure to yield the right of way. And I did that in less than three years, okay? So, um, so I had my license suspended a couple of times, and um, I was offered a chance to keep some of those bad things off of my record if I would attend a defensive driving class. Has anybody else ever attended defensive driving class? Okay, awesome. We got, we're in the good company here. You'll understand this. Just relax, okay, because um, it's been 34 years since I've had any kind of a ticket, which directly correlates to the time I met my now wife, who is like a rule keeper. So like we're, we're doing the thing now. Okay. So we're in, <laughs> we're in this class, right? And the instructor is going over stuff where you go, this is really stupid. Like, do we really need to be covering this right now? And he's holding up these different shapes and colored signs. Okay. And he holds up this red octagon and he says, does anybody know what this is? And I'm like, this has got to be a joke because I, I, I don't belong here. And the guy next to me, who I feel is actually hung over or drunk, and he's in the class and he's going, yeah, it, it means no cop, no stop. <laughs> <laughs> and then he laughs, okay. And I'm going, listen, I, this is so stupid. I don't belong here right now with these hardened criminals, right? Hey, okay, listen, I was just in a little bit of a hurry. I was not paying attention. I had good reasons to actually do what I did when I did them. And I'd never do what you did. Okay, I sped a little bit. I'd never run through a stop sign right there. And we can judge people by our goodness and then we compare it to their badness. Religious people, by the way, don't have the courage to say out loud what he just said. <laughs> right? We don't have the courage to actually live it in front of all these other people and let you know what we're doing. We're just going to keep it all hidden. Oh, we'd never run off to a big city and waste all of our money on a prostitute. We'll just open up the computer or get on our phone and nobody will ever know that we did it. See, the goal for, that one kind of hurt, didn't it? The goal for older religious brothers isn't to become more like the father. It is only to be a little bit better than the brother. And the way to do that is to make sure that what everyone sees on the outside is good without drawing any attention to what might be going on in our heart. That makes it easy to say, I would never do anything like that. I'm better than him. Which inevitably leads to attitude number four, you can't be forgiven. Okay, you can't be forgiven. Like, how are we just going to welcome this guy back in after he blew all the money and now we're throwing a party and how do we just forgive him for what he's done? He doesn't deserve that. And there's a part of me that goes, yeah, you made those choices. You deserve the consequences, right? That, that's what you get. You don't deserve to be forgiven. So let's be honest here again, and I'm going to throw this in for free on the side. Part of what irritates some of us, by the way, about the idea of a younger son being welcomed back after all of the choices that he's made, right, is that if we truly believe that that's the way it works, okay, you go live your life however you want, but God's obligated to welcome you back. Like if we really believe that that's the way that it works, some of us are now looking back going, man, I'd have taken my chance a long time ago. <laughs> Like there is like this secret life that some of us wish we had lived to have had that experience if we believed God welcomes everybody back. And we wouldn't dare do it now, but we secretly go, man, I wish I would have at least tried it. So listen, it is extremely difficult for older brothers to celebrate the repentance of younger sons because we either can't see it or we don't remember our own past mistakes. Hey, older sons, by the way, we believe in the idea of forgiveness if we actually thought that we needed it. <laughs> we believe that all of our goodness is what's actually earned us a place with the Father, and all of your badness should actually keep you from a place with the Father. Like this whole idea of grace and mercy and forgiveness, like it just seems too easy when you've done the kinds of things that he did. You don't deserve that. But that's the very definition of grace, right? You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. 
the people that have hurt you and offended you and mistreated you and taken advantage of you in your life, they don't deserve that. But please understand this, the party, like we're going to throw a party, is a declaration that's full of forgiveness for everybody that's invited. Listen, it's the Father's house. You don't get to decide. I don't get to decide. The older brother doesn't get to decide who's invited and who's welcomed in. So the father makes one final appeal, and he says, son, you're always with me. Or it could be, hey, you stayed with me. Or, hey, I get it. But can we lay to rest the idea that the father loves the little brother more? Like he's saying, look, you, you're in the field, you're in the house, we're together. You have full access to me. He says, everything I have is yours. And that's the truth, right? Last week we said when the father divides up his stuff, a third goes to the younger brother, but as the more older, respected, supposed responsible one, two-thirds of everything goes to the older brother. So everything, right, 66%, what I have, it's yours. (laughs) Now, it might sting a little bit because, like, every drink that gets poured every piece of sound of equipment that they bring in, right? Every steak that goes off the grill, he's probably going, am I paying for this right now? And he probably is. (laughs) But you kind of picture this where the father's final words are, but we had to celebrate. Like we have to rejoice. Here's why. Because the brother of yours was dead. He's alive again. He was lost and he is found. And in the same way last week, we kind of pictured the father and the way that he embraced um, the younger son. I kind of picture maybe this dad comes out here and um, the very personal terms, right? This, not just my son, this brother of yours. And I, I kind of see him maybe like either put his hands on his shoulders like this and pull him in or maybe even, you know, put his, put his face in his hand and say, listen, can't you see that we had to do this? Like he was as good as dead. He's alive. He was lost. He's found. The party is going to go on with or without you. Will you please come in? Come in. I want to celebrate with both of my boys. I want to celebrate with you too. And the way that Jesus ends the story, like there's a lot of things that we don't know. Like we don't know how the younger son actually responds to being celebrated. We don't know if the older brother actually goes inside. We know that the party goes on. Let me say this and I'll give you two takeaways for us to think about. Sometimes it can seem like for some of us that we make a much bigger deal about people that are welcomed in than the people who never left. But you got to understand, the party is for everyone. The party is for everyone who's a son or a daughter of the Father. And as long as I remain outside of the party, I can only remain in my resentful complaints that result from my comparison. Okay, maybe God really does love younger rebellious sons who return home more. I think there's maybe a little moment like that for some of us when we celebrate baptism. We baptized another person in the first service this morning. There's going to be a bunch of people next week. I I don't know where we are this year. I think in the high 50s, numbers of people who have taken the next step this year um, in baptism. And sometimes I, I think we see the looks and we can see the tears and we see the emotion and we see what we might call repentance. And then after all that, we see like the big celebration and we clap and we cheer. And, and here's why we do that, right? Because a lost son or a daughter is essentially coming home. And so we're, there's a party happening, right? The Bible tells us there's a party happening in heaven. And so in that one minute here, that response, we're just practicing for a much bigger party. Every once in a while, it might actually creep into one of us where we start to question, like, why does that person get celebrated? Why why, why would we celebrate that person? Because I'm doing all the right things here. I'm taking my next steps. When, When do we celebrate that? I want to give you one thing to think about is that when we celebrate that, that should be a reminder for all of us about how God still feels about you, right? Both sons are invited to be at home with the father. So let me give you two things to think about, and then we'll sing, we'll go. Uh, Number one, religious older brothers are just as far from the father as rebellious younger sons. Okay, religious older brothers are just as far from the father as rebellious younger sons. You know, Jesus paints an amazing picture here in this story. 
that summarizes what we would call the gospel, okay, the gospel message. And God is the father and the party is the celebration of the saved. And you have the younger son who's completely rebellious, but he turns back towards home, right? And then he goes in and he's reunited with his father, but it's the older son, uh, ironically, right? The good son who possibly refuses to go in and is the one who's lost, right? Two sons, two groups of people. And it's taken me a while to understand this. The more I read it and think about it, I think this is right. That the two groups here are not, you know, the sinners and the saints. I don't think the two groups here are the rebellious and the religious. I think the two groups here are sinners who see their need for grace and sinners who don't. You can keep on trying to be good and do good and appear good as a means to try to get God to actually love you. And the danger is that we end up trusting in our own goodness rather than in God's. So let me just encourage you here to do what I would consider to be maybe a ruthless inventory on your life and, and find a way to try to tap into your need for the Father's grace. See, younger sons do this really well because we reach a point where we go, I got, I got nothing else to try. I'm just going to try to fall on the Father's grace. And I love this quote from Christian author Brennan Manning. You might want to take a picture of this or copy it from the notes. He says, when you've made a slobbering mess of your life, compassion becomes a tad easier if you're conscientious in taking your own inventory rather than someone else's. So I move to stop comparing myself to others, right? I'm going to start to look deep within and what I have to be forgiven, right? How do I actually draw on grace and draw near to the heart of the Father? Where, where do I need his grace? And see, when I can actually start to see my need to, I guess, know the Father, and rely on the Father, not on self here, serve the Father out of love, then I can see myself not as a servant, I can see myself as a loved son or daughter. I'm going to draw closer and closer to the Father. Number two, like this ending, religious older brothers who love the Father take responsibility for and celebrate when rebellious younger sons come home. Okay? Okay. Religious older brothers who love the Father take responsibility for and celebrate when rebellious younger sons come home. Most older brothers, by the way, want to be known for what they stand against, right? Here's what I don't do. I don't drink, at least not in front of anybody. I don't smoke, I don't curse, we don't play cards, all the things, the list of things you can do, right? Tradition tells us, though, that in the first century Middle Eastern culture that the older brother has at least one or two things that he should be known for. See, it tells us that um, it would be the responsibility of the older brother to go looking for the younger brother once we knew he was missing and in trouble and had nowhere else to turn. Like, it would be his responsibility to go searching for him to see if he could find him. And, okay, in the moment last week when we read about the father who sees him and he runs to him and how he embraces him and responds, at a minimum, the older brother would be right behind the father or trying to pass the father to also be cheering and embracing and welcoming and celebrating. So let me just say this as a church. If we stop appealing to younger brothers to come home, we'll know, okay, that we've started to tip the scales and we're becoming more full of older brothers. We can't let that happen. So I just want to ask you here in the end, if we could maybe pack together, okay? Can we pack together? Will you keep running after younger sons and daughters with me? Yeah, can we do that? I mean, will you keep helping to create environment around here where more younger sons and daughters actually feel welcome? Like, will, will, will you do whatever it takes? This is going to be a big ask that I'm not asking anybody else of, but will you do whatever it takes to actually make room for them when they get here? Which means some of you who have the option today to come at 8.30 or 11.30, can you come at 8.30? Actually, will you come at 11.30? Let's be specific. 
That's a simple thing you could do, right? Because listen, we, we all know how great it is to have a relationship with the Father because we know, right? We're trying to tap into what it is that he's actually done for us. So whether you relate to the younger son or whether you relate to the older brother, you're loved by the Father, you have a home with the Father, and everything that he has is yours. And we receive it the same way. Please don't miss that. It's a gift from the Father who loves us, not because of what we do, but because of who you are a son or a daughter of a most high father, God. And I think we should celebrate that together today. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for this story that Jesus tells that just hits on so much stuff, like we could spend so much time on it. But God, today we pray specifically that as we identify perhaps with an older religious brother, God, just we ask for that to fall away. God, help us to uh, to, to love you and serve you out of relationship, God, not to get anything from you or manipulate you or try to earn our spot or keep our spot. God, today we just thank you for the grace you've given to us. Remind us of it. Help us tap into it. Revisit it over and over again and to celebrate wholeheartedly when younger sons come home. And we pray this in your name. Amen.